and we're live. Welcome to the 14th episode of Interchain FM. I'm your host, Chango Unchained. And I am your co-host, Christopher Goes. We are joined today by Sentinel. Sentinel, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Chris and Django. Uh, I'm Dan, and I'm the CEO of Exidio. And Exidio is a software development arm building on the Sentinel network. So yeah, Sentinel is, uh, is exciting. We're finally going live on mainnet on Saturday on Cosmos, and it's been years in the making. So it's happening. Congratulations. We get to have our, our launch event. Yay, great. Awesome, so, congrats. What, what's the relationship between Exidio and Sentinel? Yeah, so Exidio is um, one of the contributors to the Sentinel DVPN protocol, but Sentinel itself is a peer-to-peer -peer network. So anyone that wants to offer bandwidth to the network, or anyone wants to use bandwidth on the network, that's the Sentinel network, and uh, anyone can contribute to the network. Um, and then Exidio, we're the software development arm that's helping to build integrations on top of the network. So Sentinel is really like a base layer framework for anyone that wants to plug into this peer-to-peer -peer bandwidth network. And if you want to build your own custom decentralized VPN on top of the Sentinel network, you can hire Exidio and we'll help you with integration and customization and a lot of the front end development. So uh, are you guys a development agency? Yeah, exactly. Software development agency and we're looking to scale right now. Um, you might have known uh, Tony Stark or Iron Man in the Cosmos community. Uh, he's our CTO, Srini, and he's he's been a badass, and so we're lucky to have him. And now we're building out a team around him um, on the tech side. But you guys used to be an anonymous team, weren't you? And why why did you suddenly uh, become public facing? Yeah, no, that's right. So it was just this last year in 2020 that we formed Exidio, and Srini and I uh, came together to co-found Exidio. And we knew that Sentinel had a huge opportunity, um, but it wasn't able to reach its true potential because of its anonymity and because um, we weren't able to make inroads with, uh, within the Cosmos ecosystem, within uh, key partners with, across um, blockchain and, and across internet networking. Uh, and so we realized that for the long-term viability of the project and be able to reach uh, mass adoption of decentralized VPN, we needed to have names and faces behind the organization. So Exidio is a software development arm. Um, and, and we incorporated that in 2020. And then we also incorporated the SNT Foundation, which is the, um, the foundation that, grow, that has the mission of growing uh, the Sentinel network. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. And so it was a long time coming. I've been, I've been actually more of a community member and supporter of Sentinel from the onset. Uh, in 2017, I got involved with uh, the project just more as an enthusiast. And I also had purchased uh, Sent tokens. And then from that time on, I was always more of someone that stayed very informed on the project and on the tech and was kind of a cheerleader in the community. And then I finished my MBA uh, in May of last year. And right at that time, uh, I was working with uh, Project Autonomy and uh, he was working to get uh, some of the pieces in place to establish Exidio. And, um, and so then from there, we established the company. And, and now, now we're at a point where we're finally going on mainnet and uh, we're just cat. We're capitalized. Uh, the S and T Foundation just completed a capital raise, and now we have uh, a lot ahead of us. Great. Well, congratulations. So you guys are launching Mainnet in three days. We should probably talk about that. Let's do it. Yeah. No, actually, two days uh, on at twelve UTC on Saturday. Um, so it's it's coming up, and we're yeah really excited about it. It's been a long time making, and it was just today that the, um, the token swap process went live. So you can swap your uh, ERC-20 send tokens uh, and send them to a burn address. And then on the 27th at Genesis block, um, those tokens will be minted as new Sentinel Cosmos-based tokens. So you guys were originally on Ethereum and then yeah. you spent years developing with Cosmos SDK, launched your own chain, and now you guys are doing a migration. Exactly right. Yeah. So, um, and we've been involved with the Sentinel ecosystem for a while. Srini has uh, been really a leader and has helped with uh, participating in Game of Zones and Game of Stakes. Um, and it's kind of finally, it's a momentous occasion for us because it's, it's just been a long time in the, in the making. Um, and I think another thing to your point, Chango, about having an anonymous team, it's harder to point fingers at people and hold people accountable when there's 
a lot of different developers and, and different people contributing, but there aren't people putting their names out there. And so mm-hmm. I think more with like a traditional structure, um, we have a stronger level of accountability and uh, I would say overall organizational performance. And so I'm, I'm pumped to kind of help shepherd that. Sure, yeah. What was the uh, user experience like using Cosmos SDK? I'm just curious what you guys uh, like used to to determine why you wanted to use Cosmos. Yeah, so I think that came back to um, Osmodot of Kira Network had back in 2017 <laughs> yeah, yeah. was uh, speaking with um, with Srini with uh, Iron Man, and uh, in doing so, um, he kind of convinced. Uh, Srini of the power of, of Cosmos and the power of um, an inter, interoperable blockchain and how that's going to really be important for a blockchain-based uh, VPN network because we need to be able to make micropayments uh, and be able to make payments as people use bandwidth in real time, as well as um, the, the payment gateways to have the interoperability between chains. So uh, with, with that architecture, that was when um, Srini started getting very interested in, in Cosmos and started digging a lot deeper. Um, and our implementation of Cosmos is pretty vanilla uh, from the SDK side. So it's it's not uh, highly customized. Okay. Well, how does the chain work? Is if, yeah, how does how does DVPN work <laughs> on yeah. Sentinel? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's actually a really good use case for blockchain. So the blockchain itself is where all of the uh, information about the nodes that are offering bandwidth to the network is hosted. So if you're, um, Chango, for example, if you want to offer bandwidth to the network and, and um, provide bandwidth to this, this marketplace, you offer your excess bandwidth to the network running a simple Docker image. Um, and then in doing so, you post that information to the blockchain. And then if I want to connect to your node and be able to route my traffic through your IP address, I find that on the front end application that I'm using, the Sentinel DVPN or the Velocity VPN or any other white labeled um, VPN clients built on the Sentinel network. But the only way that those nodes are displaying on my phone or on my device is because that it's calling the blockchain via API um, to dis- display the information. So all of the nodes that are offering bandwidth are posted to the blockchain and then uh, front end applications are calling the blockchain to display it. All right, well, let's break that down uh, a little bit. So, um, we, we, we want to talk about the problem statement, right? Which, which is, well, you've built something that solves effectively proof of bandwidth where nodes are uh, sharing bandwidth with, with one another to provide this Tor-like network. Yeah. Um, but, you know, why is this, why is this important? And, and where do the token economics come to play to incentivize people to run these nodes? Sure. I, I, I can break that down, I guess, into the two questions. So, um, like how does this network come into play? Um, so the the basic architecture is what I was explaining earlier is that the um, the nodes that are posted to the blockchain are the ones that are um, the ones that are displayed on your front end application. Um, and so the so are, are these are right. these uh, different from consensus nodes? Yeah, so there's yeah, those are two separate nodes. We have people that are offering uh, validation of the blockchain as you know that are offering the validation validating the blockchain and those are separate nodes than dvpn nodes that are offering their bandwidth in the network so yeah those are two kind of separate categories of nodes so so is is there like a is there the base layer chain and then a second layer uh dvpn network running on top of the chain or or yeah so there can be different dvpn zones so you could spin up your own dvpn zone based on the uh the hub zone architecture um, but the like Sentinel DVPN protocol is the hub, and then you can have different DVPN zones built on top of that. Okay, so you could have multiple like layer layer two DVPN zones, I suppose, running on top of the Sentinel yeah. base chain. Yeah, so it's like horizontally um, horizontally um, scalable that you can have multiple DVPN zones running on the on the hub. Oh, so so those those DVPN zones are are chains in and of themselves. Um, I don't, I don't believe so. I think that they're just posting to the blockchain, but the, each individual zone, um, is what we would be able to spin up for different, uh, companies on one white label and create their own DVPN. Okay. Yeah. And some of these super technical questions around the, te- the architecture of the blockchain are, are, 
better to be speaking with uh, Srini than myself. I am, I'm not a native developer. And so I, I understand the tech at a pretty high level, but at uh, certain architecture levels, I, I always kind of double check and refer with him. Yeah. What is the connection between the, uh, well, actually I have two questions, which perhaps are naive, uh, but one, what does it mean to decentralize a VPN? Uh, and two, what is the connection between the VPN, which presumably is doing some kind of uh, internet protocol based routing and the blockchain? Is the blockchain yeah. just like a disconnected registry or can it in some fashion verify whether the VPN service is being provided as promised? Yeah, no, those are good questions. So what's the true value of a decentralized VPN over like the current architecture of a, like VPNs that we use today, like Nord or ExpressVPN? Well, first of all, what is it? like? I yeah. know when I use a normal VPN, what's happening? It's that my internet connect, I, internet packets get tunneled through a computer somewhere else, and then they go to wherever website they were originally destined for, come back through the tunnel, and come back to me. Is that the same thing? Is the same thing happening in a decentralized VPN or something else? Yeah. So that is the same uh, process that is happening as far as um, packet routing through uh, different IP addresses and then getting tunneled back to, to your computer. Uh, but the difference in the architecture is that this is a peer-to-peer -peer network and anyone can offer bandwidth to the network and you can route it through um, a myriad of different IP addresses that can be residential or they can be um, like node farm IP addresses. And so they're not all owned by a centralized company. And so it's really about the benefits of, of, of using a decentralized VPN over centralized VPN. Because it's um, a peer-to-peer -peer network and anyone can spin up nodes and offer bandwidth to the network, not only can it scale infinitely, but you it's far more robust. Uh, because you're not depending on just the exclusive nodes that your VPN provider offers. And if they're using like a cloud hosting service like DigitalOcean or AWS and those get shut down, then then they're at like uh, then they have huge risk for the success of their actual nodes and their business. Whereas the blockchain, as long as there's validators that are securing the blockchain and the blockchain is live, then anyone that's offering bandwidth to the network, those that bandwidth is posted to the blockchain. And then all the front end applications are just simply calling the blockchain. So with the, the decentralized architecture, you can, there's a lot of benefits. Not only is, do you have the risk of not getting shut down by AWS or, um, you know, Azure, but you also have the benefit of um, oftentimes these, the, like a lot of centralized VPN companies, their IP addresses get identified and then get blacklisted for certain websites. And they still don't feed, uh, offer the benefit of being able to access geo-restricted content or other information. Whereas with residential nodes and um, different uh, IP addresses around the world, you have a, a much more resilient structure where a lot of those um, IP addresses are not already blacklisted. Yeah, so the, the problem with, I guess, centralized VPN is that they could get subpoenaed at any time by government agencies. And you also run into an issue if, let's say, that a uh, company decides to sell to some, <laughs> but you know, foreign intelligence agency or or what have you, and suddenly all the privacy benefits you had goes out the door. Exactly, it might not even be as extreme and nefarious as selling to a you know a bad actor that's a government agency. Um, it can be just that they're reselling your that your metadata to other companies that want to leverage it for their own advertising or for their own information. Um, a lot of VPN companies claim that they're not logging data, and they also claim that there's like third-party audits that are proving that they're not logging data, but then there's still closed source architectures and you can't even prove that that's the case. And NordVPN in, in 2019 was hacked and it was proving that they were logging user data. So instead of trusting our IP, um, uh, you know, our, our uh, ISP to not be sharing our information and reselling it, which we know a lot of them are, now we're just, moving that liability down the line to our centralized VPN company. And a lot of them are not good actors. And actually that in the industry itself is really messy. Um, it's hard to know who actually is running what companies. Uh, a lot of companies have front facing, you know, brands, but if you really peel back the onion, it's really an oligopoly of several companies that are uh, running multiple different brands and, and um, it's not as distributed and, and um, competitive of an of, of industry as it may seem. And so, yeah, a lot of companies are logging user data. And in a decentralized network, uh, there's no one company that could actually log or track your data. The only person that has the endpoint, the actual metadata, is is the um, the exit node. And so, you know, if that would be each individual, but they still wouldn't have the original IP address of the 
individual that's hosting their network through that through their node. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you use some uh, jargon mm -hmm. like exit node that is used in uh, the Tor network. So maybe mm -hmm. we could um, take a step back and talk about that architecture for a little bit, which is yeah. Uh, decentralized VPN is effectively an incentivized Tor network where uh, in the Tor network, they have like entry, exit, and relay nodes, but there's n there's no incentive to run them. And so how, how does Sentinel incentivize these uh, people to run nodes and take such risk upon themselves, ex especially if you're running something like an exit node and uh, passing through unencrypted data that may or may not incriminate you based on the usage of uh, whoever's entering this network. Yeah, so I can speak to both of those things. So how, do, how does Sentinel incentivize um, node runners, like you said, either relay nodes that are people that are um, having internet traffic pass through their nodes, but are not the actual ones that are um, passing it through to the end node or exit nodes, the ones that are actually, like you said, having the metadata passing through their IP address. Mm -hmm. um, and that's done through the Sentinel native token. Um, and so with that token, um, people have the ability to, and the incentive to offer this bandwidth. They're not just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts like they are in the Tor network, but they're doing it because there's an economic incentive to do so. Um, and so uh, they can set their own custom rates for the amount of revenue they want to generate based on the bandwidth that they're offering. And with a, within the competitive marketplace, you know, if you're charging an exorbitant amount, people might not decide to route their traffic through your um, your node because it doesn't make economical sense. So in doing so, it, it actually makes for a very cost competitive um, environment for people to actually get access to VPN. Um, but then the um, the that architecture is a lot more robust and resilient than, like you said, a Tor network. That was the original issue is that Tor doesn't have the security that it claims to have because there's far more users on the Tor network. There's millions of users. There's only several thousand nodes that are offering bandwidth to the network. And so if someone wanted to co-op the network and take over a lot of those nodes, they're able to do so because of the extreme disparity between the amount of users and the amount of nodes. Um, but as you grow the network, as you grow a network and incentivize it, you make for a far more resilient network um, that hopefully does over the long term actually you know become the next incentivized and uh, robust tour network so for somebody who wants to i guess earn scent and mm -hmm. uh like okay look mine scent let's say by running a uh a dvpn node how would they do that what's the setup look like yeah so the setup is not that complicated um we you, if you go to docs.sentinel.co um, the, the instructions are there, but you simply run a Docker image and then um, run uh, the scripts to be able to set up the, the node. You can do it, you know, uh, just based on through your computer or you could do it um, from a, uh, a Raspberry Pi. Um, the, the actual hardware specifications aren't that high, um, but we're looking for other solutions in the future uh, in 2021 to later this year to be able to make it even easier. So we wanna make it a seamless and, and uh, plug and play process for people to be able to access, to offer bandwidth of the network. But as of right now, you would need to be able to um, at least set up your Docker image and, and offer the bandwidth. So what binds the payment in these tokens to the bandwidth offered? Is the client who's purchasing VPN service like micro paying for every bit of bandwidth they use or is that, is that enforced or tracked by the blockchain? Are the payments happening on the blockchain? How does the blockchain know anything about the internet traffic or is it just kind of honor system? And you know, if, if, it, if it's not paid, people quit. What's the connective substrate there? Yeah, that's a good question, Christopher. So there's two ways that users can pay for accessing decentralized VPN. And one could be like that uh, architecture you talked about paying based on the amount of bandwidth used. Um, and we're still kind of cracking that code. Um, we were working on figuring out um, bandwidth signatures, as Chango mentioned earlier in the podcast. Uh, and with that, you'll be able to pay um, at the very micro level as you're using bandwidth. Um, but that's a pretty complicated technical uh, challenge that I think we're getting close to solving. Uh, that'll be a pretty big breakthrough. And then the other way is the more traditional method where you would have um, a certain amount of uh, bandwidth that you'd be able to use 
um, and then paying like you you have unlimited amount of bandwidth and you're paying on a monthly subscription. Um, so users can choose between a more traditional model, a subscription model, and a uh, pay-as-you-go model. Um, and nodes can offer either of the two for uh, receiving payment. And this is all going to happen when we monetize the network. So we're going live on mainnet on Saturday. Uh, and then the monetization of the network is um, expected to come in the following weeks. So there's still a lot ahead of us, but um, we've been working on it on testnet. And so now we're just needing to implement it live. So the only other project in the blockchain space that uh, I can think of who's solving this problem is Orchid Protocol. And how are you guys different? Yeah, it's not just Orchid. There's a couple. There's uh, Mysterium is also uh, working on uh, decentralized VPN. And there's a couple other projects that are in similar spaces or maybe slightly adjacent. Um, but one thing I would say that differentiates us from Orchid is the Sentinel network is truly a peer-to-peer -peer network where anyone can offer bandwidth to the network and anyone can plug into their network. Where Orchid is um, today still centralized, they use three VPN companies as their node providers to be able to offer bandwidth to the network. So I guess that's better than just relying on one VPN company, um, but it's still a pretty centralized system. Um, yeah, they that's not really proof of bandwidth. Yeah, um, and and I'm you know I'm I'm hoping for the best for Orchid, and ho hopefully they do make it a peer-to-peer -peer network. But uh, to date, they, I don't think they've kind of, kind of gotten that figured out. Another challenge they're facing, I think, is being uh, native on Ethereum. Um, it makes it really complicated for users to be able to. Um, and, and until maybe they're able to implement effective L2 scaling solutions, I think that it's challenging for a bandwidth network. Yeah, uh, totally. To, to work on Ethereum. Yeah, something yeah, of like, this scale needs its own chain and yeah. a consensus mechanism. Exactly. And, and I think if you just download the Orchid app right now and try to use it, um, there's a, a $40 um, initial hurdle that you need to pay just to be able to get access. So you couldn't even you know, try it out or use it for um, a limited amount. So that's going to already be uh, a hurdle that will probably stop adoption for a lot of people that want to just try the application. Was this a realization that you guys bumped into when you were building on Ethereum originally? Yeah. I, again, I can't take credit. Um, this is something that Srini saw was going to be a challenge from from early on, especially with his conversations with Asmodot, and realized that uh, Ethereum wasn't going to have the, the scaling solutions to be able to run a peer-to-peer -peer bandwidth network where all the nodes are posting to the blockchain and pinging the blockchain um, on a real-time basis. So yeah, that was definitely a foresight um, that they had even back in um, 2018. And what exactly uh, are nodes pinging uh, are appending to the blockchain? What kind of data is it? So it would be the throughput, um, the the throughput the of bandwidth? the network. Yeah, the throughput of the bandwidth, um, the latency, um, the IP address, some of the basic information about each node and, um, that you would want to know their their location. Um, so you know where you're connecting into. Yeah. So why would anyone want to run a node, and why would anyone want to use this network? So you'd want to use this network for the same reason that you'd want to use a VPN um, that's a centralized player. So if you want to be able to, there's two main reasons: be able to keep your da data private and secure because it's your own data. So obfuscate your internet traffic so that your IP, um, your internet service provider is not able to monitor all your metadata. That's definitely a huge use case. Um, and then another would be for being able to get access to data that you wouldn't otherwise, be it geo-restricted data, or sometimes it's just even basic you know, usage. A lot of a common use for a VPN is to be able to get access to Netflix when you're traveling abroad. Um, so for all the same information, the same reasons you use a centralized VPN, but now you're able to use one that's provably end-to-end -end encrypted um, and that is not logging your data. And are there clients basically that provide the same user experience? Yeah, so that's crucial. Absolutely. If we don't provide the same user experience as, as NordVPN or Tunnel Bay or ExpressVPN, then this entire effort is in vain because really it needs to be an, an application for mass consumer adoption. And so that's one thing that I think Sentinel's done extremely well is uh, the first VPN uh, application came out in, I believe, like May of 2018. And it was a desktop application. And it was pretty clunky and it didn't have the best user experience um, and consistently asking the community for feedback 
taking in notes how you could how we can make it more seam, uh, seamless and streamlined. Uh, Sentinel put out the first uh, mobile application in um, June of 2019, and then completely overhauled it. We completely overhauled it in July of 2020, and we've gotten a ton of good feedback on the Google Play Store, and now we're on iOS um, based on user feedback and um, making sure that the user experience is as seamless as it is on centralized uh, VPNs. So okay, and and. And does the Scent token double as a staking token for the hub? Yeah. So the token itself has quite a few use cases on mainnet. So yes, it is a, a staking and governance token um, where you're, you know, as well a token, as 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 well as token for the DVPN. Yeah. Okay. So you get so people that are holding the token and staking it are earning staking rewards as well as earning twenty percent of the um, revenue across the network that would otherwise go to um, node providers. So if you're offering bandwidth to the network, you're you're generating 80% of that revenue that um, is trans that you're you should be earning across the network, and 20% is that going back to staking token holders that are staking the token. Um, and there are other additional use cases. So if uh, a node runner that wants to earn uh, tokens but in more of a stable uh, currency, the cent token could be used as um, a collateral token to be able to peg um, back a stable coin. Um, so there are other different iterations that we can look at for benefits and uses of the token in the future. But yeah, it's primarily used for staking and governance, for um, earning revenue for offering bandwidth in the network, uh, and as well as uh, used to being pay payment for um, bandwidth on the network. Got it. And you talked about uh, future potential pegging for uh, to a stable coin, mm -hmm. right? Is that what's That's the plan there? That's something we've uh, discussed and we would, you know, look for partners to be able to work with us on that. Kira would definitely be um, a project we would work with. Um, uh, you mean you, you, would, you, would, you would connect to a, a DEX? Yeah, so we would look at um, having like a collateralized debt product where you would have um, kind of like the MakerDAO system. So with um, Maker and then DAI. So, you know, Scent token could be the, the Maker token and be over collateralized. So then you can have the DAI. If, if um, hey, like a node host want to be able to earn tokens in a stable coin and maybe they're not interested in, you know, holding a token that's volatile, that's definitely another use case um, that we could have down the road. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder what that does uh, plugging DeFi into this system to mm -hmm. the incentives of running a node. So I think the main thing is it would, if, if you wanted to run a node and just know exactly how much you're going to earn and then you can hold it in that stable coin and you want to be able to keep that value, that's, that would be the main use case or benefit. Because we see that this is, an op this is a product that's going to have significant adoption, not just within people in the crypto world, but really across, you know, mainstream consumers. And we're already seeing that. Um, the Sentinel DVPN application has had over 150,000 downloads. And uh, another company is already built on the Sentinel network. Um, Velocity is a decentralized VPN built by Elysium. And that pro um, product has over 100,000 downloads. And so we're seeing that there's users across the world that are looking for decentralized VPN and, and they're finding uh, Sentinel. Actually, I had a friend text me the other day. I worked with him in the past and he said, is, is this your Sentinel VPN? And I said, what? And he said, yeah, my company is making me download it for work right now. Um, and his company had never, you know, has no connection to the project or us or whatever. So we're seeing that the, um, the broader marketplace is looking for products like these. And so we want to make sure that whether you're getting paid in, uh, if you're offering bandwidth, if you want to get paid in a stable coin, that could be a, an option for you. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, I want to talk about your community. Mm -hmm. I've been called a blue friend. Yeah. What is that? The Blue Friend Gang. No, it's crazy. It's it's uh, it's really um, it's rewarding and humbling to see so many people that are rallying around this concept. That I think people realize that um, we need for a better decentralized web, and and kind of that they see Sentinel as part of the core stack of the Web three. And so there's a lot of people that are super pumped about what we're building, and we're seeing that kind of pop up in, in, on Twitter and on 4chan and, and in our Telegram group. So. They've uh, meme them, mean themselves into becoming blue frogs, and there's the blue friend gang, which are uh, all the blue frogs that come together and are working to spread the gospel of decentralized VPN. It's it's pretty awesome to see. So, do you guys have a 4chan like community, or, or 
I mean, I, I, well, where I'm did not, they come from? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I uh, it, there's a lot of people that I, I would say that there's people from 4chan, there's people from Reddit, there's people from Twitter. Um, it's kind of cool to see like this movement kind of coalescing right around the time that we have mainnet. I, I am not a regular on 4chan, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, but as sometimes people forward me posts saying, check out all this activity on 4chan. I'm like, it's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, I do think that it's a very much like a grassroots m- movement of people that probably people that are interested in the Tor network and seeing that the Tor, Tor network itself has uh, its own flaws and, and are looking to build something that's more robust. Um, but mm-hmm. it's, it's Sentinel has been around since 2017. So we've built, um, and, and I think that one thing Sentinel's done very well is consistent communication and updates and letting the community know about uh, releases that are coming. And, and uh, so I think that level of consistency and communication has helped build a, a stronger community over time. Yeah, great. You guys... You guys have done a really good job. Okay, so a lot of uh, organic content stuff coming out. There's just a research report of like 50 pages. Uh, that's like some of the best research I've ever seen. It's up there with like Delphi Digital or uh, you know Alameda Research or um, you know like Masari, and it's just on. Uh, it's all on breaking down Sentinel from multiple angles, and they just did one on the Kosh Network as well. So it's cool to see people really seeing the value in what we're building. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yep. Somebody in the chat said memes and free speech slash decentralization go hand in hand. Amen. Hell yes. All right. Yeah. So you, you've got some free speech advocates and crypto anarchists and, and for four chan memers in your community. That's great. Yeah. My, my yeah it's, people. it's a quite the eclectic bunch. I love it. Okay, great. So, We could take uh, questions and comments from the stream. Uh, so, so somebody somebody asked, or somebody asked if someone could provide a link to the project. Um, another person asked, yeah. So 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 we'll go ahead and do that. Um, Crypto Tiger asks. In how many years can Sentinel have at least five or ten percent of the DVPN market share? Of the decentralized VPN market share, I would say zero. I would say that we have significantly more than five or ten percent at this point in time. Um, but if you're talking about the centralized VPN market share, um, I think that you know that this is speculation. But we have ambitious growth goals. Um, like I said, we're at over two hundred thousand active users on uh, decentralized VPN applications built on Sentinel. And we're looking to get that over a million by 2021 and really scaling that over 10 million uh, next year. So the goals of our growth are ambitious. Um, there's, you know, there's hundred, like over hundred million users across the world of uh, centralized VPNs. Um, and the network, the, the VPN market is right now is about 30 million, $30 billion market. Uh, and it's expected to grow to $107 billion market in the next five years. Um, and so the, the centralized VPN market is growing exponentially and we see that the decentralized VPN market is going to uh, grow, but probably at a faster rate. Uh, and we really want to be the project leading the decentralized VPN marketplace. Uh, Yoru Kama says, found it, looking forward to getting involved. DVPN is going to be huge, in my opinion, and Cosmos Tournament seems like a perfect platform for it. Let's rock. We'll see you in the community. Join uh join t dot me slash sentinel underscore co. And apparently you have uh, Pepe on your website. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you're so, uh, we we're doing the token swap right now, um, and uh, so it's swap sentinel co. And so anyone that's holding the ERC twenty tokens, we're finally like as we go into mainnet, um, you can swap your tokens and burn them, and uh, you can see that um. Pepe's about to blast off in his uh, in his rocket ship right now. He's getting ready for mainnet. And yeah, by the way, I feel like I feel the need to say this. Um, blue Pepe isn't racist because he's blue. As if he's not <laughs> white Pepe. <laughs> Sorry, maybe that was important. He's a, he's a lover. He might be sad sometimes, but he's a lover. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you just answered the question that Steven Saunders had, which is how does the swap process work? Seems pretty straightforward, right? You could just 
swap an ERC token for a for a Cosmos based coin. Exactly. And um, Stephen, the best way to do it is uh, if you go to Sentinel's Medium. Um, our blog just came out today. Or if you go onto our Telegram or onto our Twitter, you'll see the link to the blog, and it has a step by step process breaking it down with uh, instructions throughout the throughout the way. Yep. And let's take this opportunity to remind people to not give away their mnemonics. Amen. Because that's been happening Amen. a lot in the Cosmos ecosystem lately. Well, I got, this is a huge uh, issue for us right now, as everyone's just meant to creating their new sense addresses for sure. Right. So beware of fishers um, and don't trust any stranger on the internet that pings you, telling you that they will help you as long as you enter into a third party website and put your mnemonic in because it probably is a phishing site. Amen. Thank you, Chango. And actually, on our on our medium, we highlight that as well. Only use the link inside the medium article to get to the swap site. Yep. Lots of money flowing around. Lots of tricksters. Amen. Okay. Let's, uh, good old Lord Nine says, "Tell me more about white labeled apps progress." Five K subs VPN guy. Maybe one other guy with Blue Frog branding. So white label VPN progress, this is where I think this is where the Sentinel network really is the opportunity to take on that market share of centralized VPNs. So uh, Exidia, we built the Sentinel DVPN, but I already talked about Elysium, built the Velocity VPN. There's a lot of other projects and, and companies that are coming to Sentinel and coming to Exidio saying, we really like the architecture of this network. We don't want to uh, rely on our own nodes anymore. We want to build on the Sentinel framework. Um, and so... In the coming months, we're going to be onboarding a lot more companies that are be able to build their own white labeled VPN apps. Uh, and this is where we see uh, the true opportunity for scale. Uh, so this is going to be interesting. And um, it's it's going to be a process as we grow both the supply side and more nodes offering bandwidth to the network, um, as well as more companies that want to build on the network. Right now, we have more people that want to build on the network and we have more demand than we even can handle um, because we haven't grown and monetized the, um, the node network. So once we do that, we see expect to see an explosive growth on people offering bandwidth in the network. And then in doing that, we'll be able to bring on more companies. Very good. Um, so I, I have I have a closing question almost, which is which is you mentioned the D web or the decentralized web and how Sentinel's DVPN solution could potentially lend to that. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, there's a tweet that I think we could we should share and we can maybe put in the show notes. Uh, Greg Osuri, uh, the CEO of Akash Network, put out a tweet around what are the core like layers of infrastructure for the decentralized web? And obviously for decentralized cloud compute, um, he's highlighting Akash as, as an important player in that. Um, but he talked about decentralized name basing, uh, name services, like um, uh, the Handshake Network mm -hmm. or decentralized uh, file storage like SIA or um, Filecoin and decentralized um, middleware like the graph protocol. And then for decentralized bandwidth or networking, he highlighted Sentinel as a project that's crucial in the decentralized networking stack. So they're, I think they're the core layers of um, internet networking and the internet and the in decentralized web that we need to be able to build and have um, pretty res resilient before we're able to build more decentralized third party applications on top of the decentralized web. Yeah, all of the pieces at the infrastructure layer needs to be available before you could have something like decentralized social networking, yeah. uh, uncensorable search engines, and all of that. Yeah, decentralized Airbnb, exactly. Yeah, and and chat decentralized uh, chat channels, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. I think that was a lot of 2017, where a lot of huge promises that you know, we're going to have everything solved and uh, we're going to put this, you know, run a big ICO and all of a sudden now everyone's going to port from, you know, Airbnb to B token. Um, <laughs> and it, it was just, it was insane. Um, but as you, I think now we're actually seeing some of this infrastructure actually get built out and actually work. And Akash is a great example of that. Um, and so as we build out the, the core infrastructure layers, uh, I think we are going to actually make this transition to a decentralized web. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we are going to talk to Akash in the next Interchain episode, by the way. They're coming awesome. on in the next two weeks. So we are going to talk about all of this and comment on what happened with Pancake Swap and Cream Finance, where they were attacked at the DNS level or at the mm -hmm. TLD level. Um, excuse me. And so, yeah, the, the stuff the stuff is really important, and it's really good that um, somebody is is you know uh, is 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 solving the uh, bandwidth problem. It's a really hard problem to solve, and and so I I, I also hesitate to to say that it is solved. And going back yeah. to the the um, 2017 days, it's it's I I think you know people said it was the Cambrian explosion of coins, but it really was the Cambrian explosion of ideas. Yeah. Um. And, and now years later, we're 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 building towards those ideas that uh may finally arrive in like you know the next two to two to ten years. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but if we're looking on the hundred year time horizon, even two to ten years isn't that long. But right. Uh, yeah. With the, the way that we're operating, we're definitely heads down and we're very focused on, like you said, proving ourselves, you know, decentralized bandwidth at scale is, is yet to be proven. Um, we're seeing it happen, you know, on our test nets and, and on, on our Ethereum test net, but really going on mainnet and then really monetizing the network is some of the first initial tests for Sentinel. And then from there, it's, it's stress testing the network and seeing it scale. Um, so to your point, I think we still have a lot to prove. But we're hungry and we're excited and we have our eyes on the prize and one day at a time we're going to keep building. Yeah, how, how does this network scale? So I think it's really about offering, it's more people offering bandwidth in the network. That's what was the, the choke point for the Tor network. So as more people are offering decentralized uh, bandwidth and as more people are offering decentralized bandwidth from not only residential IP addresses, but um, from uh, node farms and different servers, that's where you see the opportunity for more and more companies to build on the network. And then the, the network itself kind of eats, it starts eating other networks and starts growing upon itself. Um, we're definitely not at that point yet, but that's where we see the, the vision of, of the network growing. Um, and we see huge opportunities for us to plug into other nodes that are already in existence. So StrongBlock um, is a project that provides nodes and um, oftentimes more nodes for um, validation blockchains, but they have the capacity to run DVPN nodes. Um, Pivx is a privacy-focused project that runs master nodes. So there's a lot of community-based node programs where those individuals, um, when we monetize the network, are going to be excited to plug into the Sentinel network and help scale the supply side. Um, but that's really, I think, the opportunity to have this entire project scale is really growing the supply side of people offering bandwidth to the network. It sounds like the network will inevitably scale to like large institutional players, given that the um, reward is high enough, just like how individual miners eventually became institu institutional miners because it was, uh, it was, there was enough incentive to do that. The is there any them. issue? It, it, are there problems with that? Like, let's say for example, in the future, there's going to be an AWS sized um, <laughs> node provider. Is, is there going to be recentralization? I mean, that's definitely a consideration. You're right that we need to that we need to monitor and make sure that it becomes a pretty robust network. Um, that's obviously the concern that happened on Tor is that uh, it's hard to say that a lot of the nodes weren't starting to be run by the same players. Um, so I think as you incentivize individuals to contribute. Uh, that's the, the key way to make sure that it stays decentralized. Um, and then you also need to make sure that uh, you're making it easy and accessible for anyone to offer in bandwidth through a node, uh, uh, offer bandwidth via their own node. So that's, like I said, one of our big um, projects this year that we don't, we can't quite detail all of the things that we're working on, uh, but we want to make it a far more seamless experience to be able to offer bandwidth. Um, and if everyone has excess bandwidth and they're in, you know, they're already in their homes and they're already paying for it, this is, uh, an asset that you already have access to that you could be monetizing. So we see a huge opportunity for individuals to contribute. Great. We'll take, uh, let's see, a couple more questions. Um, uh, Crypto Tiger asks, what price predictions for each token once it has a good percentage of the total market share? 
Um, that's a great question. I think you could probably do some discounted cash flow models or think about what um, the amount that, of revenue that's generated across the network is and then how much that would accrue to the token. Um, but that's really not my place to say. I, I can't make price predictions on the token itself. Um, but what we see, what we're focused on is mass adoption of decentralized VPN. And uh, we do believe that as the network grows, um, that people that are early in the network and they're supporting it should see also that a value crew to their, um, to their holdings as well. Okay. Good old Lord nine asks, how do you plan to compete with centralized VPNs? Yeah. So part of it is marketing and communications, right? Like the whole adage, like build it and they will come. We kind of know is BS, right? Like there's a reason that, um, big VPN companies are on every single podcast and they're on every video on YouTube and you see their advertisements everywhere because they know that they need, they need to bring their products to consumers directly. So we need to con compete as well with um, a, both with the, the blue friend gang and the, the kind of grassroots marketing, um, but more the traditional marketing. And so we've actually hired on uh, Win Crypto to help us with uh, marketing and communications in um, the East, especially in China and, um, and uh, Vietnam and uh, Korea. And then we've hired uh, Waxman um, to help us with PR and communications in the West. Uh, and then we're also bringing on more people on our marketing team to help us with um, traditional marketing and communications channels. So marketing communications is going to be crucial. And then we're also going to be hiring people for business development to bring on more companies that want to bring white label solutions to market uh, via the central via the Sentinel DBPN marketplace. Um, those are two big initiatives. And then the, the, the main thing is continuing to grow the supply side of the network. As more people offer bandwidth to the network, we can bring on more companies that build on top of the network, and it has a, uh, a compounding effect. Your Yorukama asks, I noticed you have a Chinese section on Medium. Are you guys involved with breaking down the Great Firewall? If so, I'm even more excited. <laughs> yeah, the, the point of sensor, the decentralized VPN is that it is more robust and more resilient than centralized companies. So as node hosts offer bandwidth, they can select what open source VPN protocol they're using. So they can use OpenVPN or, um, or WireGuard or um, Stock5 or IKF2. So there's all these different open VPN protocols and uh, some of them are far more resilient to different um, you know, attacks or blocks than others. So being able to beat the great firewall is something that uh, some of those open VPN protocols are capable of doing. And with a decentralized VPN architecture, you're far more agile and be able to implement whatever open source protocol you want. So it's definitely a, a goal. That is a really hard problem to solve. <laughs> yeah, so we've had nodes that have run on, um, uh, it depends on the application, right? So like, this is why I think certain projects that are like looking to completely recreate uh, open source protocols, are gonna have a hard time because of the compatibility with devices. So nodes on um, iOS devices used to have to be um, IKF2 nodes. Um, I think iOS will starting, start to allow WireGuard, um, but it depends on the device and the, uh, uh, cap the, why can't I talk now, the uh, capability as well. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a challenge to solve, but nodes can run any open source protocol and you can see what node you're plugging into and what, um, what open source protocol they're running. Yeah. And so uh, in in the near future, do you see the world of decentralized web being so accessible that even people in China could potentially uh, access websites that they wouldn't otherwise? Yeah, I mean, people are using Sentinel VPN and have been able to do that from China that, and, and they hadn't been able to do that with their centralized uh, VPN products right now. So this is something that we're actually getting feedback on from uh, users in China. And it's definitely not ubiquitous, like you said, um, but we're, I think the more that the network grows and the more that there's more nodes offering different open VPN protocols, um, the more that the network becomes a lot more resilient. And, and then, so yeah, I definitely see that as, as an option, but of course it's gonna always be a cat and mouse game. As a lot of people are looking to get access to information that uh, the CCTP doesn't want, the CCTP is going to um, try to shut down those avenues as well. So that's why I think a decentralized network is um, has a lot more potential because it has the ability to be agile and um, different nodes can offer whatever uh, open uh, VPN protocol they want. 
Yeah, what what is the uh, user experience in trying to like, uh, based on the anecdotes you've heard? Yeah. It, I imagine so, it's like playing whack-a-mole, where trying to just like shuts down one centralized VPN, and then another pops up, and then you try to shut it down again. Yeah, exactly. And it's also something that you can't even speak about publicly in China. You can't, you can't, because VPN in and of itself is illegal, you can't even promote that you're, you're using a VPN or advertise VPNs. Um, so it's definitely more of like a, people are always talking about it with one another or there's conversations on WeChat about what they're using. But, uh, you know, on any website or on any promotional material, you can't talk about VPN or using VPNs. Um, but we've had good feedback from uh, users. So WinCrypto is uh, an ad agency out of China. And we have their users and they're using the Sentinel VPN right now. And they're really impressed with the, the user experience. Um, but we haven't tried, you know, I don't know exactly all the websites that they've tried and if they've had challenges with getting some content or, or not others. Um, but we can follow up on that. I think that that's, like you said, it's an ongoing cat and mouse game. Yeah, here's another use case that you uh, kind of lightly brushed up on, which is WeChat. So in the future, <laughs> how could we uh, decentralize chat applications that uh, couldn't be, you know, read by some some like central company, for example, like like WeChat. Yeah, um, I think that that's interesting. I think that this is why I'm more confident in the decentralized web and where we're headed. Um, you know, even like the situation that happened with GameStop and how Robinhood and a bunch of brokers shut down um, when they when the price of GameStop was pumping. Um, and they said the game's over and, you know, like you no longer can play. We're starting to see that there's a tension between big, gov like big government and big corporations and individual users. And so we're seeing a huge rise in people downloading uh, Telegram or Signal because they're looking for more um, secure uh, chat applications after uh, WhatsApp came out with news that they were going to be um, not ma making it opt in for end-to-end um, -end encryption instead of um, easy access for end-to-end -end encryption. And so I think we're starting to see people look for decentralized solutions. Uh, I think that D DeFi is going to be huge um, as like, finance um, players make it very difficult to make it a seamless experience and also take advantage of users' trust. Uh, so I do think that um, decentralized chat applications are going to grow over time. It's just going to be a matter of, like you said, as they grow, how do they make sure that they stay decentralized? Um, and I think decentralized chat, like you mentioned earlier, Django, is going to be an imp important uh, technical solution later on after the we have a more resilient uh, infrastructure for all the applications to be built on top of. Yeah, what's interesting about DeFi is that as that narrative is getting mature and all the tools around it are um, getting more and more easy to use, we are also moving towards this decentralized web where all of these DeFi products could be built in natively to a future of decentralized applications. Don't get me too excited. I think that's the vision, right? I know, right? That's that's <laughs> where we that's where we want to see. Like it's the internet was relatively, you know, decentralized when it when we first when it first came out, and that was the vision of access to the web, right? And um, you know, centralized companies that had that saw the opportunity to create better user experiences became so powerful. And now we have our digital overlords. Um, and so this is kind of our movement back to decentralizing the web and making it more accessible. And it's, it shouldn't be just like a technophile, you know, thing for a certain niche corner of the internet. It should be everyone has access to the centralized web and it should have the same user experience as we have right now. Um, I definitely think that's going to take years to be able to realize that vision. But um, just thinking about it gets me pumped up. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I, I definitely anticipate seeing the next killer app emerge out of um, this whole decentralized decentralization movement, which is, we, you know, we might have like a future uh, blockchain based Google or or something like that come out and just kill it or like the next decentralized twitter right everyone's trying to build a, a, a twitter killer these days yeah well and, and even was it like it was 2017 2018 like the ton blockchain and they were they were working on building uh 
Telegram to be to actually be a decentralized network, um, and, and that got shut down by the SEC, and uh, that whole project I think slowed a lot of its progress. But I think there's going to be, like you said, a killer app that a lot of people use, like everyone's using, and it's it's actually a decentralized network, and that's yeah. that's amazing to think about. I, I would yeah. say that one other product that is doing incredible in this space is um, Terra. Um, and, the, and the Luna token, Terra is, the Luna token is actually being used by hundreds of thousands of people in Korea on a daily basis for payments. Um, so I think we're starting to see the glimpses of some of these decentralized web applications getting extreme adoption. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were talking about TON, T-O-N, the Telegram TON project that was uh, that raised several hundred millions of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one last question, and then we'll close up. Yorukama asks, do you think 5G will help with bandwidth limitations on a DVPN system? Have your car run as a smart node or your phone? Wow, that's interesting. Um, I think that that's definitely beyond what we're looking at in the immediate term. Um, but I think that that is interesting. Like, being able to provide more, uh, like, not only just having a computer be a bandwidth node or uh, a, um, but having any IoT device be a bandwidth node. I think that's really cool and really interesting. Um, and that could potentially make it a lot easier to make this network even more robust and um, strong. But we're definitely not there yet, but that's, that's an interesting thought. I think that that's uh, a cool place that we could head. You know, we've been talking about IoT as an, you know, as an industry, we've been talking about it for, I don't know, like more than five years and it's just never come, <laughs> it I mean, never happened. Yeah, I've never gotten too interested. I mean, I was pumped about like Google Glass when they, that was a concept at first. It seemed really cool and techno futury, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. Do I really need like my refrigerator to be connected to the internet? Maybe, maybe I'm short-sighted, <laughs> maybe it should, but. Maybe I'm just a boomer that doesn't see the value in that. Um, but we will, I think we will see a lot more devices connected, um, especially I think in healthcare. It should be interesting um, as we have bio devices that connect with um, our, our, all, all of our, you know, bio, um, uh, bio information. So we'll see. I think that, um, you know, that's bioscience is going to be in a really interesting space over the next uh, five to 10 years as well. Goodness. I, I only think about a dystopic future <laughs> where that happens. I mean, <laughs> look, we could say the same thing about pretty much anything, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, technology in and of itself, is just a tool it can be used for good or evil. Yeah. Yeah. Ma so, yeah. So some, some can help you mitigate surveillance while others just um, expedite it. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Well, I'm, that's why the DCEP, you know, is, is crazy to me, like uh, Chinese uh, digital currency, the, the amount of capital controls and information they'll have around their entire, you know, population is, is staggering. And, and it's, you know, I don't even know how big China is, 1.5 billion people. Um, it's, it's, it's scary. And I think like you're, you're right, we need to continue to fight against um, these, these systems so that we don't just easily adopt them because of the convenience. We, we saw what happened when we gave all information to, to Facebook and didn't question it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. This was an excellent interview. Thank you for coming on, Dan. And, you know, we'd love to talk more about D-Web online with you. Uh, cool. Thank you, everyone who has joined us. You know, we're on the one hour mark. And Yorukama says, it is not the gun, it is the person that uses it. Expands to other tech, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, pe people tend not to uh, look at the shooter, but at the at the weapon, which the weapon is just the tool for, for the user. So yeah, you can infer what my Second Amendment stance is. <laughs> nice. Yep. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you on the next Interchain FM where we will be talking to Greg Osori of Akash about how decentralized compute is going to disrupt centralized compute, AWS. Bye everyone. Yeah, see you.